Let us bow our heads and bow before our Heavenly Father. Dear Heavenly Father, we come into thy presence again, recalling that thou art more holy than we can understand. We pray that thou wouldst be pleased to look down upon us, dear Father, and cleanse us from every wrong thought and word and deed. As we look unto the Lord Jesus Christ, who is the way, the truth, and the life, coming to thee only through him. And we pray that thou wouldst be pleased to bless our worship, to be with us, even as we gather together, as we dwell together, as we read thy words, as we calm our hearts and prepare our minds to consider the things of eternity, the things which will affect our souls, dear Lord, and the things of thy realm, which is outside of time, Bless us now, dear Lord, and help us, help the one who will speak and those who will hear as we seek to open thy words and to honour thee and to glory in thee. In the Saviour's precious name we pray. Amen. <clears throat> Our first hymn, friends, is 821 in Gatsby's hymn book. The Tune is Glasgow, hymn 821. Father of heaven, almighty King, how wondrous is thy love, that worms of dust thy praise should sing, and thou their songs approve. <coughs>
Please turn with me to the Gospel according to Luke and the 23rd chapter. Luke chapter 23. And we're reading from verse 38. Luke chapter 23, verse 38. And a superscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. And one of the malefactors which were hanged railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom and jesus said unto him verily i say unto thee today shalt thou be with me in paradise and it was about the sixth hour and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour and the sun was darkened and the veil of the temple was rent in the midst and when jesus had cried with a loud voice he said father into thy hands i commend my spirit and having said thus he gave up the ghost now when the centurion saw what was done he glorified god saying certainly this was a righteous man and all the people that came together to that sight beholding the things which were done smote their breasts and returned and all his acquaintance and the women that followed him from galilee stood afar off beholding these things well may god bless that portion of his words for his glory and our good Gatsby's Friends, number 36. <coughs> the tune is Monk Monkland. Hymn number 36. Hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king. Peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconcile. <coughs> Oh, 
bow again before our God in heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, we come again into thy presence. We would bow before thee in, in body and in heart, confessing ourselves, dear Lord, to be unworthy, to be unclean, to be sinful. And we would pray, dear Heavenly Father, that thou wouldst receive us into thy presence again through our high priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, who intercedes for us, who makes our words heard by thee, as we seek to honour thee, dear Lord, we seek to worship thee truly and deeply and sincerely, trusting in the Holy Spirit to work within us, dear Lord, not trusting in our own abilities and talents and reasoning and intellect, but trusting only in the Spirit's work as the Spirit moves among us, dear Lord, and inclines us to be given strange attention and focus and love of thee, we pray, dear Lord, that we would remember that thou art a sovereign, almighty God, who doeth as thou wilt, to whomsoever thou wilt, whensoever thou wilt, who can stay thy hand, dear Lord, for thou art the God in heaven who is mighty and eternal and infinite and all-knowing and all-seeing, ever-present, all-powerful. We bow beneath thee, dear Lord. We would remember Daniel's trembling in thy presence and we would pray that thou wouldst be with us now dear Lord as we confess unto thee the sins of our words and thoughts and deeds as we would recall those things which make us not Christ-like which make us not like the Lord Jesus but make us like our own selves in our own personalities in our own flesh and we would pray that repentance may be granted unto us dear father we would pray for renewal if we are those of faith and for um, a conviction dear lord a conversion if we are not thine we would pray dear lord that thou wouldst indeed work mightily within us we would pray that through the preaching of thy word and through the opening and the reading of thy word that thou wouldst be pleased to enliven us dear lord and to grant us those things which are not natural to us in our fallen states we would thank thee, dear Lord. We would thank thee for healthy bodies and minds. We would thank thee for this very congregation and this very chapel, this very uh, land in which we may freely worship thee, dear Lord. We may come into thy presence. We may indeed sing thy praises, fearless, dear Lord, of physical, bodily persecution and punishment. And we would think back to the great heritage of wonderful um, works which thou hast done dear lord throughout the centuries of time even in this land we would pray that thou wouldst continue to work wonderfully in this land we would pray for the rulers whom thou hast seen fit to place above us our prime minister our king the government the um, various rulers of crime and and, um, and police and education and local governments the various things which thou hast founded and instituted for the, the safety and preservation of society. We would thank thee, dear Lord, for the institution of marriage, for the blessing of family, and the blessing of uh, being given sound mind and sound bodies. And we would pray, dear Lord, that thou wouldst indeed work wonderfully in our midst. We would pray for conversions, even in our midst, and we would pray for in-gathering among the local community in which this building is existing. We would pray that there may be um, men and women and boys and girls who feel inclined to come among us, dear Lord. We would pray that thou wouldst bless invitations given out and other forms of literature dispersed. We would pray that thy hand would be upon such things. We would pray that the Holy Spirit would be pleased to uh, build up this congregation and, and um, to do thy holy and blessed work in our midst dear lord we would faint as we contemplate these things we would not a part of us and a part of our own natures believe that these things are possible they do not seem likely by our own eyes and our own reasoning but we trust in an all-powerful and holy god and we believe that thou canst do what we cannot do that god in heaven may work where feeble and frail men and women um, doubt and, and have struggles of 
a lack of faith and lack of assurance and lack of belief in thy promises have mercy upon us dear lord cleanse us and incline us in better ways we would pray and we will pray again for those further afield we would pray for um the, the kingdom family dear lord who are due to return to um, africa in the new year we would pray that there may be great blessing as they return to the mission there we would pray that there may be stability and we would pray that there would be a building up of those people dear lord those souls that there may be a church which is honoring unto thee and which is blessed by thy hands and which would be a great a witness to that area of the world we will pray for thy hand to be upon the awful conflicts about which we see in our news dear lord we will pray for spiritual eyes as we see these things under thy um, all-powerful hands the acts of providence the plan of salvation working out dear lord even among awful and unspeakable events across Europe and involving Russia, involving Israel and many other areas upon this earth, dear Lord, we would pray that thy restraining hand may restrain and restrict great suffering and great evil atrocities. And we would pray that there may even be churches built up and missionaries blessed. And we would pray for um, Christian principles to be enacted, dear Father. We would thank thee that the influence of Christianity has even affected the secondary things of this world, the political and the military um, situations upon this earth. We would pray that thou wouldst be pleased to revive people in different areas of this world, especially in that land known as Israel and Palestine. We would pray for revival there and, and for believers to be given great courage, dear Lord, and great um, peace in believing upon the Lord Jesus Christ. We would pray for many other things too. We would, we would pray for those who are with child. We would pray that the delivery may be blessed to the Lord. And, and we would pray even for a second birth upon the young child within. We would pray for those who um, are suffering, dear Lord, from loneliness and from mental and physical uh, difficulties. We would sympathize, dear Lord. We would seek to be those who would reach out and think upon the struggles of others and to be those who have that mind of Christ, dear Lord, always looking outwards and always looking to the one who is um, not in, these, in the inward circle, but in the outward periphery, perhaps, the one who is um, like a lost sheep, dear Lord, straying far away from the flock. We would pray for all of these things, dear Father, and we would pray above all that thy name may be honoured and gloried in, and that the Lord Jesus Christ may be upon our minds and in our hearts now. In his name we pray. Amen. Sing together, friends, hymn number 16 in Gatsby's hymn book. The tune is Leicester. Hymn number 16. The Father is a holy God, his ho holy Son he gave, who freely shed atoning blood, a guilty world to save. <coughs>
Well, it's just a great privilege to be gathered among you again. And the title of this sermon then is Six Seas, Two Thieves, One Turned. Six Seas, Two Thieves, One Turned. And we will look again at the 23rd chapter of Luke after we look at the 20. 20- seventh chapter of Matthew. So I want to take you back to the gospel according to Matthew initially. And why am I doing that? Well, the gospel of Matthew in chapter 27 and in verses 38 to 44 really talks about the human race as a whole. It does not specifically focus upon these two thieves. And so we read in Matthew 27, and then we will return to Luke 23, all four Gospels interlock and harmonize completely, perfectly. But in this 27th chapter of Matthew, then, we read about the world in general, the world of those times. Then there were two thieves in verse 38, crucified with him, the Lord Jesus, one on the right hand and another on the left. And they that passed by reviled him, wagging their heads. This is the general world of those times. This is the general Jewish and some Gentile soldier world of those long ago days when the Roman Empire was dominant And they, in general, reviled. They, in general, wagged their heads. And in verse 40, saying, Thou that destroyest the temple and buildest it in three days, save thyself. If thou be the Son of God, come down from the cross. And so our first heading is C for cynical. We are looking at the extreme cynicism or cynical outlook of this fallen and dark world. We are looking at men and women, just as in our day, who are very cynical about the claims which are in God's word. People who should know better, people who have the witness of creation, people who have the witness of their own consciences, no excuse. And the Jewish people of those days have especially no reason whatsoever to be cynical. They had every reason for hope, every reason for joy, every reason for celebration. We read in Hebrews, the third chapter, verse 19, that these Jewish people could not enter in because of unbelief they could not enter in to heaven because of unbelief they were cynical they had extreme cynicism about the truth of god's word they were okay with their religion they loved their religion they were okay with their buildings they loved their buildings they were okay with their ethnic heritage and pedigree they loved their ethnic heritage and pedigree. And so it goes on throughout human history. All we, like uh, stray sheep, have gone far away from our shepherd in heaven. They are no different to us. The Jewish nation was a representative, a typical nation. But here in verse 41, likewise, also the chief priests mocking him with the scribes and elders. These were the very pinnacle of society these were those who if we were to compare with our day would be priests would be archbishops would be those schooled in the highest places in in the land the likes of oxford the likes of cambridge these were people fluent in multiple languages these were people of immense learning and immense intelligence people who would make the general population look up to them they were authority figures And they were mocking, and they were cynical, and they rejected their saviour. 
four things in particular were denied. Four things in particular were viewed with extreme cynicism, in particular with this man, the Lord Jesus Christ. The first thing in verse 40 is this idea that he was more than just a man. In verse 40, they loved their temple, they loved their building, and they heard the Lord Jesus Christ say, if this building were destroyed, I will raise it up in three days. And this was offensive. This was appalling to their national honor, their national pride and their national dignity. But these chief priests and these scribes, these elders, they had the very scriptures read to them over centuries of time. We read at this time, especially when much of the Western world and even the non-Western world celebrates Christmas in Isaiah chapter nine, in verse six, his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace, this Messiah, this Jesus, this promised and prophesied one was all of these things and many more. He was not merely a mortal man. He was not merely a sinner like you and me. He was far more. So they viewed his claims to deity with extreme suspicion, with cynicism, with hatred. It offended them. The second thing in particular that they viewed cynically was his kingship in verse 42. He saved others himself. He cannot save. If he be the king of Israel, let him come down from the cross. And we will believe. You can hear the hatred on the page 2,000 years later. Well, it was his kingship that they despised, his royal identity. This was offensive. This was appalling to them. This was the chief reason, his deity and his claim to be the royal king of Israel. These were the chief reasons why he was put to death. These were the claims that they despise. We read, don't we, in Isaiah again, chapter 53, Isaiah has sometimes been called the fifth gospel, along with Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the gospel according to Isaiah. Well, in that famous 53rd chapter, we read that Messiah, when he shall come, has no form nor comeliness. When we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. The people were looking for an extraordinarily handsome and extraordinarily um, beautiful ruler in the style of what they imagined David might look like. <coughs> in fact, they were probably looking for someone more like David's wayward and sinful son, Absalom. But here was this Jesus, an ordinary man. And this offended them. And this was pricking their pride. And these chief priests and these scribes and these elders in our day, this, this Pope, this Archbishop, this religious leader with um, 10,000 qualifications would look down upon the simple truths of the Bible, cynically, not believing it. And the third thing they hated was, we can read in verse 43, was the plan of salvation, which they did not and they would not understand. He trusted in God, let him deliver him now, if he will have him, for he said, I am the son of God. Well, they did not, and they would not understand that the plan of salvation is a spiritual and holy thing. In previous centuries, people have been martyred for their faith. Believers, when they become believers, are still men and women of flesh and blood, often not particularly rich and often not particularly healthy and strong and given all the blessings of the world and all the accolades of the world we read in again in isaiah the 64th chapter that we are all as an unclean thing and all our righteousnesses are as filthy rags but these proud wildly rulers would not and could not accept that they too were an unclean thing that they too had righteousness which was garbage well let me ask you, are you 
an unclean thing? Is your righteousness, is the best that you can bring to God good? Is it holy? Do you have something that others do not? Are you special? I ask myself that question. Is pride within me? Is pride within you? Are we trusting in the simple words of scripture and that alone? And the fourth thing was compassion. They did not understand, they would not understand that Jesus was anything other than a self-seeking man like the rest of us. They would not understand. And in verse 44, the thieves also, which we will come to, which were crucified with him, cast the same in his teeth. They did not see that the Lord Jesus was not there to save himself, but the Lord Jesus was there to save them. The Lord Jesus was there to save the Jews. The Lord Jesus was there to save the Gentiles. The Lord Jesus was there to bring in a wonderful spiritual kingdom. They could not, they would not understand this. And they, just like us, were living according to the flesh. We are all like this before conversion. We are no different to these thieves and these chief priests and these scribes and these elders. We are all born cynical. We do not believe the things which are revealed in the scriptures. We cannot enter heaven because of unbelief. The word cynical is actually quite an interesting word. It dates back to Greek philosophy. The cynics were a school of ancient Greek philosophy who believed in disciplining themselves and being athletic. Um, there was a man called Diogenes who was the most famous cynic of all. And he embraced that name of cynic. And he loved his cynicism. And there are four reasons why cynics are named. Firstly, the indifference of their life. Second, like a dog, they um, are shameless. Third, um, they guard their philosophy like a dog with a bone. And fourthly, um, their dog can discriminate between friends and enemies. They, they look after their pack. They hunt in packs and they bark at, drive away, bite, destroy their enemies. That is the philosophy of the world. That is cynicism in modern day speaking. It's looking after your own and only caring about what affects you personally in the flesh. We are all cynics. We will not let go of the idea that we are good people. We will not let go of the idea that we are in some way righteous, that we are not as bad as other people. Well, at least I'm not like that person. I'm better than that person. Don't you dare tell me that I'm not a good person. I'm a good person. Don't you dare judge me. That's the way of the world. It's full of cynicism. And we now move into the 23rd chapter of Luke to see our second heading, which is the word claim. Our second heading, our second C is the word claim. And in that word claim, we may turn to the 38th verse of Luke 23 and read this superscription which Pilate allowed to be written over the cross of Christ at Calvary in letters of Greek and Latin and Hebrew, all the languages of the, the empires of the world of that time. In our day, maybe it would be English and uh, Chinese and Arabic but in those days, Greek and Latin and Hebrew. And this big sign above the Lord Jesus, this is the king of the Jews. And we know that these priests and these scribes and these elders were very annoyed and very angered and wanted this sign to be taken down. And while there are many names and titles of the Lord Jesus Christ throughout the scriptures, I've counted 188 but that does not include the types and the shadows and the pictures and the prophecies. The Lord Jesus is in every page of the scripture and every claim that is made that he makes is offensive to the natural man or the natural woman. This claim offended the Jewish people's notion of being a royal and a special kingdom, which would one day have a great military and worldly political warrior to make Israel great again, to be number one in the world. Instead, this suffering servant of God appeared, and this was especially 
offensive, but all the claims of Christ are offensive. We may think of those claims in the Gospel of John, for example. The Lord Jesus claims to be the bread of life. This implies that our own bread is worthless. My own bread is my abilities and my efforts and my success and my money. This is my bread. How dare you say that I, don't, I need your bread? How dare you claim to be the bread of life? How dare you claim that I am a beggar starving? We may think of the claim of being the light of the world in the eighth chapter of John. Are you saying that my light is worthless? Are you saying my intellect and my personality is dark and sinful and will not show me the way into heaven? Well, yes, that's what that claim implies. Another claim was that the Lord Jesus Christ was the door in the 10th chapter of John, the seventh verse. He claims to be the door. Are you saying that my connections and my blood and my heritage and my social status and, and my ethnic group and my class in society is not going to open the door for me to go into heaven? Yes, that is what the claim is implying. The Lord Jesus claimed to be the good shepherd in John chapter 10, verses 11 and 14. Are you saying that my power is worthless and those people I look up to in society that I know personally and that I respect, that they are not shepherds which are fit to lead me in a way which is righteous and good? Yes, this is what the claim implies. I am the resurrection and the life. Me, am I worthless? Am I, is my life heading for eternal loss? Am I, do I not have a life? Are you telling me that I need to get a life? Yes, in John 11 and in John 14, I, I am the way. The truth and the life the Lord Jesus claimed. These are the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. Are you claiming that, and et cetera, et cetera. Every claim made by the Lord Jesus Christ, if considered for any moment of time, will be offensive to the natural man or woman, boy or girl. Because these claims imply the opposite of what they are claiming. These claims imply that you are not able to enter heaven, that you are under judgment, that the curse of death is upon you and you must pay for your sins in eternity on an ongoing basis. Well, we will move to our third uh, heading, which is uh, see what chosen. And we may look briefly at this second thief, or as it says here, malefactor in verse 39. One of them is described, cynical as the rest of the world is, cynical as we all are, saying, if thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other in verse 40, answering, rebuked him, saying, dost not thou fear God, seeing thou art in the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man hath done nothing amiss. This is extraordinary this is remarkable these men were not merely bad men these men were not merely sinners these were the very worst of sinners these were those who had been accused and found guilty of the most appalling crimes crimes which i could not mention in a pulpit things which you read about in the newspapers that make the hair on the back of your neck stick up these were wicked men these were awful men and here one of them is rebuking the other one for his wickedness. And he is stating and believing in the claim that the Lord Jesus is indeed the King of the Jews and that he is indeed guilty and sinful and deserves his punishment. It is a remarkable thing for him to say. We must remember too that these men were not simply in a coffee shop debating religion. These men were been crucified, the most cruel and lingering death reserved for the worst criminals in the Roman Empire. We must consider then why this man turned to the Lord Jesus Christ. What made him different from the other man, the other criminal? And the answer really is that he was chosen. The Bible 
um, clearly teaches the doctrine of election. In, in Matthew 22, in verse 14, it says, for many are called, but few are chosen. Matthew 24, verse 40 and 41, talks about two people in the field. One shall be taken, the other left. And two women shall be at the mill. One shall be taken, the other left. We read in John, the very famous chapter 17, the Lord Jesus prays not for the world, but for them which thou hast given me. And in verse, uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, the question is asked by the Apostle Paul, for who maketh thee to differ from another? Why did that thief, why did that wicked and evil man turn to the Lord Jesus? Can, um, claim, uh, claiming, believing, sorry, in the claim, it was the election of God, it was the sovereign will of God from eternity, before time was even a thing, that this man would be chosen and the other man would not. We do not like this doctrine. It is a difficult doctrine. It seems to be very hard to swallow when we have the most famous verse in the Bible, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is true, but equally true it is that God has chosen a vast multitude of souls from the world to save. It is equally true again that that other thief could have turned to Christ. That other thief could have received the amazing blessing of the forgiveness of all of his sins and entered into heaven, but he did not. The, the gospel is seen here. The, the thieves on the cross are given that chance to turn to the Lord Jesus Christ. Everybody in this world has that chance. Everybody in this world is called, for many are called. The world, in a sense, is called. There is the evidence of creation. There is the evidence of your own conscience. There is the evidence of the scriptures. There is the historical reality of Jesus Christ coming into this world and the enormous changes which have happened throughout history, which are incredible. The whole of modern civilization has been massively influenced by Jesus Christ. We even name our, our, our years Anno Domini. We are living in the year of our Lord, 2023. But the fact remains that one was chosen before the foundation of the world to be holy and without blame before him in love. And that many who were gathered, many of them so-called religious leaders and so-called righteous and decent, tax-paying, wholesome people were not. And this is a sobering and a difficult truth. Well, we move to our fourth heading, which is C for confessed. And it is a very important word, is it not? That we see that the, the thief in verse 41 continues to uh, proclaim the deity of Christ and the rottenness and the corruption of himself and his friend. And we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds, but this man hath done nothing amiss. This is a confession of his own sin. You must confess your sin. You must pray for the Lord to work in you, and you must confess sins and your sin. We know that men and women do not do this because they do not want their sins to be revealed. Men and women do not confess to God alone because they want to retain control over their lives. Everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, we read in John chapter 3. Neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. And this first criminal was hanging on to that sliver of self-determination and self-control. He would not confess himself to be the wicked sinner that he was. It was too painful for him. It was too humiliating. It was too disempowering. And it's remarkable, isn't it? Because he literally had nothing left to live for. He was literally being crucified. He was literally facing eternity within a few hours of time. And he still clung on to his own sense of self. He did not let go. He did not confess. 
Have you confessed to the Lord Jesus Christ your individual sins, so far as you can remember them, and your own sense of sin, your whole nature is sin? Well, we are promised in 1 John chapter 1 and verse 9, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It was not the case that the Lord Jesus turned um, to this thief or glanced in the thief's direction and said, well, I can forgive you, but I don't want to forgive you or you because you are too despicable. You have sinned too much. You are too repulsive to me. You have done crimes against humanity. You are evil. I will not let you into my kingdom. This was not what the Lord Jesus said or did. And the Bible does not trick us. And the Bible does not play a game with us. The Bible does not play religion. Men and women may play at religion. Men and women may come to church and pretend to be Christian. But God knows whether you are truly confessing in your heart or not. And he has promised to forgive you if in your own private space you confess and you plead and you cry out to God. And this brings me to my fifth heading, called, which is called out. The thief called out in verse 42. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. The, the Bible requires men and women, boys and girls, to not merely hear sermons and not merely read the Bible, but to call out to confess, to cry out. Well, why do people not do that? We know from our third heading, it is the doctrine of election. It is the fact that from eternity, they were never chosen. But the Bible still holds true that whoever calls out to God will be saved. Whoever confesses their sins will be forgiven. And we must call out. We, we cannot call out to God, however, in our own strength. The Bible never plays with us and tells us to do things we cannot do. It is true that the Bible commands us to have faith. It commands us to turn from our cynicism. It commands us to repent. But we know we cannot do that. We can only do that by grace through faith. So we even need to cry out to God to have the desire to cry out to God. Let me say that again. The Bible even commands us to cry out to God, even to have the desire to cry out to God. I cannot confess. I cannot cry out to God. I cannot deal with my own sins, with my own unbelief, with my own doubts, with my own lack of assurance, with my own inward things, which I, my own temptations, my own stumbling blocks, the things with it within me that appall me. I cannot. Well, then call out to God to give you the desire to call out to him. Cry out to God for the desire to cry out to him. Cry to God for the gift of faith. Cry to God for the gift of repentance. It is not something done by anybody's strength or power in the first place. So this prayer is a precious prayer. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. Maybe even a flawed prayer. Maybe even the prayer... It's not a very good prayer. Remember me. What, when you're in hell? What, when you're being punished? Remember me? Um, at the door of heaven, but not quite let into heaven? Remember me. It's not a very full and flowing prayer. We would not be impressed in a prayer meeting if a brother stood up and just said, remember me, and sat down again. We would not be impressed. But the prayer was heard through the Lord Jesus Christ. It was accepted by God in heaven as God the Son mediated and made the prayer acceptable, God the Holy Spirit was at work in the man's heart. We read um, in the Sermon on the Mount, don't we, about the ask and it shall be given you. Seek and ye shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. But I don't want to ask. I'm afraid to ask. I cannot ask. I don't have faith to ask. And 101 other objections. Well, pray to be given the desire to ask and pray to be given the desire to seek and pray to be given the desire to knock and keep going and don't give up. Do you believe in this? Will you confess your nature to God? Will you deal with God in the privacy of your own personal space? Will you call out? Will you call upon the name of Jesus Christ as your only hope? 
we remember, don't we, that these men whom we read about and women were very um, outwardly respectable. The, these chief priests, these scribes, these elders, these Jewish men, these Jewish women, but they were all under the judgment of God. This despised, this revolting, this, this horrible, disgusting and repulsive criminal was about to enter into heaven. What a remarkable thing. How different are the ways of God to the ways of man? How quick we are to judge people and to make strong judgments about who is good and who is bad, who is my friend, who is mine enemy. This is very human, but very flawed. It was the least likely person to be called into heaven that was called into heaven. And that brings me to my final heading, which is C, for consoled, the criminal, the thief, the repulsive man was consoled by the Lord Jesus Christ. The Lord Jesus was not messing with this man. He was not playing a game. The scriptural promises were not thrown out to be only half intended or not fully meant or not to be honored. This thief asked and it was given unto him. This thief sought and he found this thief knocked and the door was opened unto him. And Jesus said in verse 43, and we need to remember these are three men who are suffering the most unbelievable agonies. They are shouting, perhaps, one to another in extreme, unbelievable physical agony. Verily, I say unto thee, today shalt thou be with me in paradise. What, what a consolation. What a wonderful thing, what, what a comfort, what a reassuring words to hear from the king of the Jews. For him to say to someone like me, the thief may have been thinking, so that I will be not only remembered, but I will be with him in paradise. Wow, that is simply unspeakably good news to go from the very depths, to go to the very heights within minutes. An incredible reply to prayer. God answers prayer. Jesus answered this man's prayer, short and inadequate as it was. Maybe you worry your prayers won't be good enough, or they won't be holy enough, or won't be spiritual enough, or won't be accepted. Well, they will. If we remember that it, it is through Jesus Christ that any prayer is heard by God in the first place. Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. And if we think for a moment, we might think, well, but the Lord Jesus Christ was laid in the tomb for three days and nights. The Lord Jesus Christ did not ascend immediately, but spent a number of days with the early believers of the fledgling church. How could the thief be with Jesus today? Well, we need to remember the claims of Christ. He was not merely man, but he was God. He is God and he is man. He is one God-man. He is the eternal Son of God. He is as much God as God the Father is God, and God the Holy Spirit is God. We might remember at the end of the Gospel according to John that Philip wants to have dealings with God the Father. He, he doesn't quite want to deal with God the Son, and Thomas doubts uh, the Lord Jesus Christ and it is said to them, if you have seen me, you have seen God the Father. I am God. I and the Father are one, we are told in the Gospel according to John. The Lord Jesus Christ, in a way which we cannot fully understand, was inhabiting the whole of heaven and earth, even as he was reduced to a human body for a limited duration of time. The thief would indeed be with God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in a matter of minutes for eternity with the saints, the thief with the saints. It's unthinkable. It's so good. It's such a consolation. And we also may look at the subsequent verses about darkness in verse 44. And the darkness was coming in which the very sun would be concealed, the very creation that was created through the Lord Jesus Christ would not be visibly um, looking upon the suffering as the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified and he experienced 
the punishment for the sins of millions of people. He experienced millions of hells all in one person. And, but we may remember as well to warn us to conclude that there is such a thing as outer darkness. There is the darkness which exists at the moment. There is the darkness in which every cynical and wildly and unregenerate man and woman and boy and girl lives today. But there is a greater darkness which is an outer darkness, which will be experienced by those who enter hell forever. It is a solemn and a sober truth. We must think of the other thief who would enter into this outer darkness. He would enter into this hell forever. And, well, it is a solemn note on which to conclude, but it is a glorious and uplifting truth that the very worst of men who hadn't done any good deeds at all was saved for eternity to be with the Lord Jesus Christ, an unspeakable blessing. There is hope, there is light. The Lord Jesus Christ is the light and the outer darkness and the final day of judgment has not yet descended, but one day it will. And let me ask you a final question. Are you ready to meet your maker? It's a sober and sincere question to each and every one of us. Well, may God bless that sermon and use it for his purposes as we conclude. We thank Patrick for his ministry here today and pray the Lord's blessing. If the Lord will, Mr. Buffer will lead our service tomorrow evening at 7.15 on our Zoom connection. And next Lord's Day, Mr. Nigel Stoneway will lead our Sunday school and, 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 and services in this house at the usual times. <coughs> Close of this service, the precious ordinance of the Lord's table will be administered and we we pray the Lord's help and blessing there. Our final hymn is number 90, uh, 93 in Hymns for Worship. Hymn number 93. <coughs> Father of mercies, in thy word what endless glory shines. Forever be thy name adored for these celestial lines. <laughs>
we turn unto thee once more, dear heavenly Father of love, who loved the world and those who should be saved from it, millions upon millions of them, as we pray and as we adore the Son, as much God as God the Father is, who is willing to descend to such an awful depth, to pay for the sins which we have committed. And in the name of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, as much God as is the Father and the Son, three persons in one blessed triune God, we cry out to thee now. We would recall the claims of the Lord Jesus Christ. We would rejoice, dear Lord, that thou art a prayer answering God who will hear the prayer of the troubled soul crying out, dear Lord. Bless us, we pray. Be with us, each and every one, as we head out into the rest of this week, the next six days. Bless us, we pray. Look down upon us, have mercy upon us, guide us along our way. We pray it in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <laughs>